writing a letter. That's what he did. That's why we have most of the New Testament. He wrote a letter. And I think it's interesting the way he approaches the letter. He, he didn't say, okay, you guys are the ones that are right, you on the, uh, on the uh, right side of the pews, and you're the ones that are wrong. And, and, and you guys, well, well, you guys are the ones who need to leave, and you are the ones that need to stay. He didn't do that. You know why he didn't do that? Because there's only one logical conclusion to doing that. And that is, in the end, there's one person left. And they're really right. That's called a Pyrrhic victory. Have you ever heard that expression? It comes from the Latin word for fire. It means to win by destroying everything else. And that's not what God wanted. And so what Paul did was write a letter. And in this letter, he affirmed them. He knew how conflicted they were, and yet he still refers to them as saints. The one who God has made, the ones who God has made holy and set apart. That's what it means to be holy, to set apart for a purpose. And then he says, I always give thanks for you. His gratitude for them. And then finally he affirms their great giftedness. And then he proceeds to address some of the conflicts. But in the end, this is a love letter. And so finally, after, after talking about some of the things that they are conflicted about, he appeals to their deeper nature, their, their deeper gift. There are some people who say that this 1 Corinthians 13 should not be read without including the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He's, t he, he's, he's talking in chapter 12 about the gifts that they've been given and how they're using them. And he says this in the last verse. That was the Gospel of John. That would have been awkward. <laughs> he says, after talking about them using and, 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 and using the gifts that they've been given, but he says, but strive for the greater gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. And proceeds to give one of, I'm just going to go ahead and say, the most beautiful explanation definition of love that has ever, ever been written. 1 Corinthians 13. And my attempt this morning is not to try and add to it at all. It stands as a grand, beautiful achievement. And so I simply commend it to your reading again. Read it again for the first time. Let the words just sink into you the way Scripture does. My only commentary on this would simply be to remind us that there is a modern heresy about love that currently exists, and that is this, that love is a feeling. And here's where we hear that most often in modern pop music, in movies. Love is a feeling, certainly, it, it gives us feelings, but we all know that love is so much more than a feeling. I remember I was in my office counseling a man who was struggling in his marriage, and this is the way he explained it. He said, I think I've fallen out of love. And while I know being in a marriage, especially a difficult marriage, can, can just cause such deep wounding and, and, can, and can make us feel callous. The way he described it just seemed too passive to me. It seemed too superficial. Paul himself said, love is the kind of thing that you have to strive for. This is what he says at the end of his beautiful definition of love in, in, in chapter one, or verse one of chapter 14. After saying all of these beautiful things, he says to the Corinthians, pursue love and strive for it. And that phrase is the only way we can understand what Jesus means when he says, love your enemies. 
Because enemies don't give us a good feeling. We are called to strive and pursue. Love even the ones who are hard to love. Because that's what God has done for us. So that's that agape kind of love. And as I conclude my thoughts in this sermon, I, I end with three questions, or three thoughts. Something for you to think about as you go from this place. And the first one, and this is the most basic one, we've got to start with this. Do you know that you are loved by God? Do you know that? And you would think that that's such a basic question. I mean, we, we sing about it, we, 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 you know, that's what Sunday school is about. But I will tell you as a pastor, there are people who continue to be haunted by this idea that they are not worthy of God's love. Pastor, if you just knew the things that I have done in my life or the way I think, you would know that I am outside the realm of God's love, to which I submit to you Exhibit A, the Apostle Paul, who called himself the chief of sinners because he persecuted the church. The real conversion for Paul wasn't about being blinded for three days. It's about when he opened his eyes and realized that even he was loved by God. Not because of what he had accomplished, but, but simply because of what God had done for him through Christ Jesus. That's it. And so that means you, you, even you, if I need to say it that way, even you are loved by God. That is conversion. When you know and understand that. The second one is this. Can you love the other person? Now here's my challenge to you in that question. Don't think of somebody who's easy to love. I think it's great that you love them, and that they love you back, and that's a beautiful thing. But can you think of somebody who is hard to love? Maybe it's somebody you're having a, a difficult time with. Can you try to learn how to love them? Somebody's been pushed out. <clears throat> If you can do that, that's what makes you a missionary. That's how it worked for Paul. When he realized that even he could be loved, and the joy that he took in knowing that, he could not help but go out into this vast Roman Empire. I mean, think of that. Is that not the, the, the hugest job description you've ever, ever heard? Paul, you're the one guy that's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Big, hairy, audacious goal. And yet somehow it worked. Through the power of the love that he wanted to share. And then finally this, and this is going to seem like a trick question or maybe a, 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 a patronizing question, but I don't mean it that way. Do you love your church? Do you love your church? Because if you do, then that makes you the church. And when I ask this question, I don't mean the church for what it is right now. I mean the church for the way Paul saw it, even in the midst of all its messiness and its humanness. For whatever reason, the, the voice of John F. Kennedy is going through my head, ask not what your church could do for you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but that's the question. Do you love your church? That's the question that we're asking together as a congregation, as we vision together. Do we see the church for the way God sees it, the instrument that He has chosen to be the body of Christ into the world? That's the question that we're asking as we challenge you in stewardship. Can you tithe? Can you become a growth giver? Can you challenge yourself? 
Because giving is all about love. I, I think of that last verse in 1 Corinthians, now faith, hope, and love remain, these three, and the greatest of these is love. When we give, it's all about those three things. We give in faith, trusting that God can use our time, our talents, our treasures to build His kingdom. It's the same way with hope. We know that God can use this church to do amazing things, just like He did that Corinthian community. And we give because we love. And here's the way love works. It's a reciprocal thing. When we know God loves us, and that the evidence of that is that He has given us everything, life, our possessions, the gifts that we've been given, He's given us everything, and He calls us to give back. Give back that 10%, to give back. We give because we love. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this life that you call us into. We, we you know, Lord, we are humans, and we struggle, and we're messy, and yet you still have faith in us and you have hope for us. And the greatest of these, Lord, is that you love us. So change us and help us as we seek to be your people. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.